There we are. Sorry about that, guys. Hold on one second. We've got Mark with us. Hey, Mark. Hey. Sorry about that. This hey. Is I could tell something was going a little too easy, uh, but now we are on the correct channel. I guess we were just doing that for nobody because I will have to uh, reset that matrix tomorrow. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Sorry. We are live. We are like this. Why are we like this? Well, that's the way we're here to talk about tonight um, with our great guest, Mark Edward Hoyk. Um, who's here to talk us through the monkeys, and that's spelled with two E's and not a Y. I'm now realizing. Went this far in my life, did not realize that. Yes, monkeys. Really? Yeah, monkeys. I mean, the, all the, the logos and printings and such that it, I mean, it's it's cool. As long as, long as you have the love, you don't need the spelling. I don't actually know how you spell the Beatles, like the bug. Oh, it's different than the bug. I get it. So they're both spelled weird. Yeah, and then there's the birds. But spelled with spelled a Y. Oh, with a Y. Okay. Well, yeah. I guess, was it copyright infringement on the actual animal? Is that what the problem is? Just spell it like the animal. Is my point. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Mark, uh, you want to talk to us a little bit. We've gone over, like most of these weeks, me and Adam will just go back and forth on stuff that we, you know, because we're around the same age and demo usually have kind of in common that we really love like uh are you afraid of the dark or uh early internet sort of culture uh we talked a little bit about homestar runner last week which is i think where we left off on the other stream um but yeah we want to hear we want to hear from you man you've been a, a guest priority for a while now so we want to hear about what made you like this well uh i chose uh the topic of uh the monkeys uh mostly because of um, Mike Nesmith's passing, because uh, he was my favorite. But as I thought about it, uh, the monkeys to me were a wonderful gateway into so many other types of things that I now eagerly consume, not just in film, but in culture. Because okay. I discovered the monkeys around 1977 it's when they the the series first went into uh five-day syndication because up to that point even though they only went two seasons they were still getting repurposed on saturday mornings and mm -hmm. on uh i i think i i have seen uh an actual 35 millimeter print of a monkeys episode that aired during like an ABC after school block, like like they were doing after school specials back then, but they were also throwing in random episodes of the monkeys as well. Mm -hmm. So so it took a while to reach syndication, and that's when I found it. And there was a big push behind it because at the same time, uh, Arista had taken over the catalog and they put out a greatest hits record, and I you know bought that with my own money and walking to the record store as a six-year-old because it was within walking distance of my house and buying it. So, you know, very, you know, latchkey kid, uh, uh, free-range uh, childhood. And, you know, th the show was hilarious and mm -hmm. just full of, you know, you know, great repeatable dialogue and gags and, and the songs were terrific. And I spent specifically remember that when they got into the second season episodes, uh, Mickey started wearing his hair natural because, you know, the first season of the show, he was wearing like a, you know, just sort of a page boy wig. And then mm -hmm. the second season, you know, he had his, you know, curly hair going and, and I wanted so desperately to have curly hair like Mickey. So I would just try to screw <laughs> with it with my fingers and, you know, ne never got it right. Trying to get that curl, trying to get that perfect like corkscrew curl. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I'm now realizing something. I'm realizing like I have I watched this show a lot growing up. I don't like you talking about it made me realize I think I've seen the show a lot. It's starting to dawn remember. on you. Yeah, yeah. I remember this one. I guess I thought they were a fake band when I was watching it. Kind of like I guess the Partridge family was technically a real band, but I kind of considered them like a TV real they band. They were a manufactured band. Like, yes, yeah, it's yeah. not that. But they no, came it, to be more than that, right, Mark? The the miracle of the monkeys is that when they were put together, they were 
initially supposed to be a manufactured band, you know, that yeah. you had Michael and Pete, Peter, who, who could play, but weren't actors. And you had Davey and Mickey who were actors, but, you know, they could carry a tune, but they weren't musicians. And right. initially the thought was, okay, you know, they, they look convincing enough together that <laughs> we're going to have all of these, you know, great songs that, uh, Boyce and Hart and Neil Diamond and Carol King and Jerry Goffin are going to write. So, you know, we're covered. But somewhere along the line, the four of them just really got together and said, hey, you know, why, why, you know, go through the motions? Let's really get good. And so Mike and Peter learned how to act and do comedy and Mickey and Davey, you know, picked up some rudimentary instrument playing. I mean, you know, they're not, you know, they weren't ready to, you know, go on a jam session, but <laughs> they the, they all just kind of got out of their comfort zone and started really trying to be good at multiple things. And meanwhile, uh, by the third album, uh, Mike w was already an accomplished uh a singer. He had put out singles on his own before the monkeys had even come around. Uh, mm -hmm. Davy and da Davy Jones had put out an album too before yeah. the monkeys. Uh, he because he was he was kind of a he was a show tunes guy. He, you know he was a you know not quite you know the English equivalent of Broadway. You know that you know a lot of standards. West End. But, and uh, you know, and also he was cute, so he was uh, a t you know they were pushing him as a teen idol before he got the monkeys. So, but they went to their people and said, "Hey, look, you know we want to do this ourselves." And they did the headquarters album, and that is that's all their real playing, and it's it's not completely written by them, but it's mm -hmm. mostly written by them because. Mike wrote a lot of uh, really great songs for the band that uh, most of the time Mickey sang them. It, it, mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of songs that Mike sang that he didn't actually write. Gotcha. But that, that they, they, they exceeded the expectations of everybody that was working on it and they became better than they had a right to be. And, and it, and and everybody got a turn uh, that there's a there's an episode of the show in the second season where it's just them in concert and on the road and you know doing hijinks and such and there's all these little individual moments like uh, Peter gets up and he does some bluegrass picking on the banjo and you know the crowd's eating it up and it's like you know these are teeny boppers they're you know they're not into this roots music but in that context it was like whoa this is cool and then mike is doing his you know prototypical country rock that was later going to g give rise to the birds and the eagles and the uh, uh the flying burrito brothers and then you know davy is you know doing his you know stage type delivery and mickey is getting into you know fun funkier material and it's, you know, that I would compare that to a modern day band like Sloan, where, you wow. know, each of the members of that band are capable of doing something and have a strength and they do their best to balance each album out so that everybody gets a chance to show what they can do. Um, Sloan's a great reference, by the way. Like, that's a... Man, I'm such a musical, uh, like, uh, novice, but, like, great reference. Uh, Garth is saying the show is very similar in tone to a beat yeah. movie like Help. But where does Jack Nicholson come in with Head? Because that's the one I think I saw in high school, uh, along with Jack Nicholson's The Trip. He also did The Trip, right? Yes, so. yes. He wrote both of those. Mm -hmm. Because the monkeys were created, I mean, there, you know, there's plenty of your standard you know, middle-aged studio fuds, you know, who were involved and thinking, oh, well, we want to have a TV version of the Beatles and, you know, copy the same hijinks that Richard Lester is doing. But you had uh, uh, Bert Schneider, whose uh, father, Harold, was a big wig at Columbia Pictures. And you had uh, Bob Rafelson, who were 
uh, in charge of the show. It was Raybert Productions, and they you know, had ambitions and they had interesting ideas, and they were palling around with Nicholson, who was uh, you know slumming in uh, Roger Corman movies mm-hmm. and Little Shop, uh, uh, Little Shop, uh, The Raven. Uh, mm-hmm. The Wild Ride, you know, that he he did a lot of stuff for Corman. And uh, if there's a great documentary called Corman's World where Jack is interviewed about Roger and he starts crying, talking wow. about how good Roger was to him in his formative years. You know, it's it's a very emotional thing for him. You know, this was that, you know, he's not, you know, fake ashamed of, you know, all oh, these schlocky movies I did. It's like, no, this guy gave me a job and he gave me exposure. Mm-hmm. So, so Roger is already kind of going into his counterculture period, you know, making stuff like The Trip and uh, uh, Psych Out. Mm-hmm. And, and so that climate's already going and... So th- this conclave of people are all hang- hanging out together. And so Ray- Rafelson and Nicholson had the idea of head. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's a little impenetrable, but, you know, I feel like it's addressing a lot of the complaints that people had about the monkeys, about them being manufactured, about them, you know, being uh you know, not real, and and then going into the nature of artifice. Yeah, you know, that uh, mm-hmm. there's this uh, constant motif of uh, Victor Mature showing up as this <clears throat> giant antagonist. Uh, his in the credits, he's called the Big Victor, and mm-hmm. it's it's a backhanded reference to the fact that at the time, uh, the the Coal Gems record label was handled by RCA Victor. So, okay. and. Yeah, there's it, it, it's kind of like the band could have kept going, but everybody kind of recognized that if, if it was if there was any future left in it, it wasn't going to happen in the way that it was taking place. Um, you know, P- Peter was getting restless. Yeah, he wanted to do uh, more folky type stuff. You know, he had started off as a folk musician he was friends with Stephen Stills. They auditioned for the show together, so and Stephen didn't get it. But uh, plus, uh, he and uh, Mike did not have the warmest relationship. You know, they were able to work together, but more often than not, they were they were the guys who were most butting heads. So Peter was the first to leave. Uh, he left after the making of uh, their final TV special, Thirty Three and the Third Revolutions per Monkey. And wow, you can, that's a name. yeah, it's a, and that's a nutty piece of television in and of itself. Uh, but so everybody's getting a little restless in terms of, well, you know, we don't we don't want to be just a kid band anymore. We you know we want to progress, and I think Bob Rafelson and Bert Schneider we're looking to do more ambitious things that they were kind of getting tired of uh, the, the, the whole thing. Cause during the shooting of the movie, they were trolling the guys, you know, between takes, they were playing stuff like uh, the electric flag and all these other harder bands and saying, now yeah. that's real rock and roll. You know, that, um, you know, my, Mike is hanging out with people like Frank Zappa and mm-hmm. thinking about more experimental things and it, that they could have kept going. That after Peter left, there's a lot of appearances that the monkeys make on variety shows like uh, the Johnny Cash show and Laugh-In. And they're still, they're, they've still got great chemistry. They're, they could have kept it going. But Michael, you know, got a little tired of it, too. He that I think he was the most frustrated at the fact that nobody ever took the, took the band and him seriously. And, Mm -hmm. but even then, I think he also, he was also recognizing, you know, the double edgedness of it. Like he, he fulfilled his contractual obligations and then he was going to split because the final monkeys album 
in the 70s was just uh, Mickey and Davey. Okay. And, but, but, you know, Mike was doing a couple of appearances and he, and already the money getting way more complex that uh, their, their fourth album, uh, Pisces, Aquarius, Capricorn, and Jones is one of the best albums of the 60s. Like I would put that in a top Ooh. 10 with Sgt. Pepper and you know, some of the other iconic records of that time. That's, I feel and, like that's what the kids call a hot take these days. Yes. Mark. Oh, and if you if you ask me, am I a Stones guy or a Beatles guy? I say I'm a Monkees guy. Wow. That is, that is, that's just throwing that out there. That's lobbing a grenade. Well, well they, because, out, they outsold the Stones and the Beatles one year, didn't they? I don't recall. That's, I mean, what I'm realizing now is A, Davy Jones uh, has the name Davy Jones, and that is confusing to me. I thought mm-hmm. I was making that up in my head, but I was like, did one of them have the name of the pirate? Yeah, he did. I guess that's yeah. that's the truth. <laughs> uh, secondly, I always thought that they were, you said, uh, you've been mentioning the Beatles and, and, and something else, but I, you know, I feel like I used to think they were the American Beach or the British Beach Boys for some reason. So, like, I thought they were the British equivalent. I just wanted to say, like, I, I had the reverse experience with the monkeys, Mark. So I I grew up um, a Beatles fan first. So I, I was very familiar with their movies. And then um, I discovered the monkeys because my dad had their greatest hits. And so I started listening to their music and I took them at face value. And then later in life discovered the, the show. And I've never seen Head all the way through. Um, it's actually kind of hard to find now. Uh mm-hmm. Um, but later in life, I discovered like that they were put together the way they were. And then actually, I don't know if you remember video drew, they appeared on uh, boy meets world in like, yeah, but so did the, so did the beach boys, right? No, Peach boys say, uh, appeared on saved by the bell. That's right. But, no. but, um, Peter, uh, Mickey and Davey came on boy meets world. Um, uh, I, think I do remember that. And, 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 and Peter played Topanga's dad. I was about to say, uh, for a, a few Topanga, episodes, yeah. Subplot here, I, I do yeah. remember that. And they all, uh, and then at the end of the episode, Mark, they played my girl for some reason. I don't understand that. <laughs> no, so they were kind of like manufactured on TV first, and kind of worked backwards into being a real band, kind of like the Jonas Brothers or Nat and Alex Wolf, or like one of the Hanson. No, Hanson not for TV, but you know what I mean. Like there, there's yeah. an equivalent to modern modern bands today, right? Yeah, but I don't think. As, as much as plenty of the modern bands created for television are still good, I don't know if any of them rose to the occasion with the uh, amazing ingenuity that the monkeys did. Mm-hmm. You know, that mm-hmm. you know, that they again, I keep saying they they took it upon themselves to be way better than anybody demanded them to be. You know, that mm-hmm. they're that and they had this genuine chemistry between them, that it wasn't just actors playing their parts, you know, mm-hmm. that they were really gelling as a unit. And you, know, you, can, you can see it in, in, the, in, in the show, you know, the way that they bounce off each other. And one of the themes that I'll delve into later is their gift for improvisation, because you know, they – took they really immersed themselves in learning how to bounce off of each other and explore and heighten stuff you know this is and this is at the dawn of i don't know if they worked with any actual second city people but uh, paul mazursky was a writer on the show before he became you know the great director that he that he ended up being and mm-hmm. they they had they were so good at you know, knowing where to pick up with each other that sometimes they left others in the dust, that there's a, there's a second season episode where Hans Conried is the primary villain. And for, for younger people, uh, you may not know his name, but uh, Hans Conried was a great comic actor who did, he had recurring roles on several sitcoms. He did a lot of cartoon voices. He was the voice of Snidely Whiplash on Dudley Do Right. He Blazing was Saddles, right. Pardon? He, was he on Blazing Saddles? Was he in Blazing Saddles? Was he the bad guy in that? Or am I crazy? No, okay. no. 
Uh, Just another guy entirely. No, he had he had this voice that you would recognize in an instant. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you know, it sounded like, he always sounded like he was twirling a mustache. Mm -hmm. But he's he's doing an episode, and he's the the villain of the episode. And when they were making it. You know, he thought, okay, this is going to be a two-day thing. Memorize my lines, get in, get out. And but the guys are just, you know, bouncing off of each other and doing stuff off script. That the, as there's an outtake at the end of the episode where, you know, they're he's blown a line and they're running with it, and he just says, "I hate these guys." <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's like that scene in Ed Wood where the guy's just like ripping, and Bella Lugosi can't uh, can't keep up. Right. Um, so did they actually, they did actually tour though, right? I mean, they were, yes. Okay. Did you ever see them perform Mark? I was lucky enough to see the last show, uh, wow. which was a few weeks ago at the Greek. It was like a culmination of, you know, I, you know, when I was growing up, I already knew that the monkeys were split. And since the Beatles never got back together, I figured, well, I'm probably never going to get to see them. And then even after they did get back together, uh, that I think maybe, uh, you know, the, the cost of going to shows was just, you know, too prohibitive. And I just mm -hmm. happened to luck out over the fact that in uh, this incarnation of the touring band, I had a couple of friends who were in it. Yeah, that, you know, oh, one whoa. was up. Uh, one was on keys and uh, the other was uh, on guitar. And through various friends, they were able to score me a ticket. And and that and and I just instinct like all of us there just instinctively knew this was probably going to be the last show they ever did. That they they were contracted to do a cruise and they were going to try and do a makeup show in Georgia that had gotten canceled from COVID. But, you know, there, the, the vibe in the room was, you know, we're, we're seeing the last stand. And, and it, wasn't a, it wasn't a mournful vibe. It wasn't, you know, a sad. I mean, it was sad because, you know, this is the end of a big thing. But it was also just very moving and beautiful. And Mike did this uh, monologue that, you know, completely unrehearsed. Uh, talking about you know finally understanding what it would have been like for someone you know uh, like a teenager you know listening to one of their records at at the time and revisiting it years later and that it was something that had spoken to them in a way that you know other music might not have you know that you know that when when you're when you're a grown, when you're a growing kid, you know, even if you're eight years old, maybe you're maybe you're not ready for you know Tool, but you shouldn't be stuck with Rafi yeah. either. <laughs> yeah. yeah, although and, Baby Beluga has some hits on it. <laughs> I I I picked apart the themes of Banana Phone well into adulthood, but yeah. there's lots of reasons for that. Lots of reasons. For some reason, for some reason yeah. that when we talked about the LSD stuff last week, and Banana Phone was one of those songs that like. On drugs just sounded so much deeper than it actually was. Ring, 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 banana phone. Uh, but I feel like my family, what we did on a lot of car trips was listen to either audiobooks of Anne Rice on RIP uh, or mm -hmm. Dr. Demento songs, like, you know, compilations of like weird, uh, strange, almost like novelty hits, one hit wonders kind of things. Um, but I feel like the monkeys might have had a, maybe some B sides on there or something. I feel like the monkeys were on, on some of these compilations. It's very possible because, among other things, uh, the the monkey renaissance really started to happen in uh, the early 80s because that's when Rhino Records started licensing their material and ultimately bought the entire catalog. Are they the and ones that did Smothers Brothers as well? You love the Smothers Brothers. I love um, the Smothers Brothers, and I've, I feel like I saw the Rhino logo on a couple of their albums. But I could they, they might have reissued those along the okay. way, but but you know, Rhino was one of the first people to back Doctor Demento, and you know, the, mm -hmm. when I was when I was a teenager, I co-hosted a trivia, a radio trivia show no. on like the no way. Uh, <laughs> Are you? Trivia? 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I kind of bullied my way onto it. Um, <laughs> it was. It, I listened to the first episode, and it was being done by another high school kid from an, a school that I didn't go to, and it was on like the you know, the local low power community access station, and I had won the prize, and I went to the station the next week to claim it, and they invited me to sit in on the show, and eventually the guy who was partnered with uh, the primary host left, and he brought me in so so here I was like my I think my sophomore my junior year you know doing this weekly uh, trivia show and he my you know my partner uh, Solomon Davidoff I miss that guy tremendously I mean I don't know where he is we the last time oh. I heard last time I heard from him we, we were both on live journal in the 2000s and yes, that was live about journal. it that was also part of last week's episode. Although we never got around to that, live journal was my jam. Oh, I, I've I've been going through uh, my old live journal post trying to find something I wrote, and it's hard because you you can't you cannot search live journal, especially if yours was friends only. The, yeah, the, well, it's also, it, it was bought by the Russians, I believe. Like the yeah. Russian state thing, like the the state brought the deep state bought it. <laughs> did I did you? Do you remember the big uh, live journal strike of about 10, uh, 13 years ago? There was supposed to be this live journal strike. There was this one. Did that coincide with the writer's strike? Because that was 13 years ago as well, wasn't it? There there was going to be one big day where everybody was, you know, where people were asked, do not post, do not read, you know, stay off of live journal this day because, because, uh, I think you know the people who were buying it. There were talks of monetizing it further, and you know, if I remember correctly from the episode I listened to of like, uh, oh God, was it one of those podcast things that everyone loves? And I'm now blanking on the name. They did a whole episode on Live Journal, and the thing was that uh, Russians, Russian, you know, citizens had been using it to like just call out the government for like bullshit. And uh, the government was like, screw that. But they couldn't find a way to shut it down because it was owned by, you know, somebody here in America. So what they did was they just bought it specifically so they could censor it in Russia. Like, mm. so they could keep it from being platform, like keeping these people from having a platform. So I remember I was already over at Tumblr by the time this happened, but <laughs> it was a big deal. I mean, I went from Zenga to Live Journal. Remember Zenga? That was another one. Uh, or, 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 or or Diary Land. <laughs> Diary Land, that was a big one. Uh, I was my first one was Angel Fire. I had an Angel Fire like website. <laughs> uh, so yeah, early internet, early internet stuff. But um, oh yeah, what I'd like to imagine, Mark, is that at some point your parents got angry at you for spending too much time on this trivia stuff and said, you know, you can't make a career off of that. And then like <laughs> you fast forward to like today, you're like, yeah, well, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm still not really making that much of a career off of it, so. But um, you've made a hell of a there. reputation. That yeah, that's you. right. Yeah. Now well, your reputation don't pay rent. <laughs> uh, fair, fair enough. Terrible roommate reputation. Um. So. Oh, and I, I had plenty is, of terrible roommates along the way too. <laughs> Jesus, I mean, the roommate stuff. Uh, we could do a whole episode of why we like this. It's just roommate edition, and it's just me explaining like why I'm like this based on good and terrible roommates I've had in the past. I've had also. I can only imagine. Uh, can, I can, can I be on that it. episode? Sure. <laughs> we can improve right now. Let's go into it, Mark. What was some of the best? Oh, uh, okay. We can do well, this. <laughs> we can put tears here. We're flex. Okay. So well, well, I will say that the best roommate situation I ever had was in uh, the early 90s from about 91 to 95. I was sharing a half double in Columbus, Ohio with uh, two. I was pursuing stand up at the time and working at an art theater. And I had two other roommates who were also stand ups. And it was this really wonderful, supportive time. And, you know, we, you know, we, we respected each other's space, but we liked being uh, together and doing stuff, you know, communally and, we were going to each other's shows and helping each other write jokes, and it was this wonderful, supportive time. That and then, but then one of them 
you know, moved in with a girlfriend and then another one, uh, what, you know, needed to move on. And then I just had a steady stream of terrible roommates after that, who, you know, you know, did not give me my, you know, their share of uh, rent and utilities. And, you know, one who's, uh, boyfriend assaulted me and oh uh, you know oh god yeah i had one of those ones and and it was Good just course. this ongoing thing that kept to the point where around late 1998 i saw an opportunity and decided okay i am i'm gonna make my leap to los angeles and yeah. where the safe roommates live yeah. Oh no. When I moved, <laughs> no. When I moved to Los Angeles, I lived. I I have lived alone ever since I came here. So. Oh wow. I de I, I decided no. I am I am done with that. You know, as much as much as I miss having company around and how it gets you know lonesome rattling about in an apartment that now looks like an episode of Hoarders. Um, <laughs> I have. I, I've seen enough of my friends dealing with bad roommate issues over the time I've lived here to know that I am damn lucky that I can afford to live by myself. Yeah. When I first saw, when I came back to LA, I mean, I've, one of my best roommate situations is the fact that Nerd Chronic let me crash on his couch at the beginning of COVID and I'm still here. Uh, but like that was, you know, that was an insane period of time because I just come from living uh, in New York with a, with my sister and some a truly crazy, like I don't like mean this per, uh, pejoratively, but I mean like this person was a little bit out to lunch and like ended up, you know, like, attacking me in the kitchen once. And I was like, oh my mm. God, I need to get out of the situation. She ended up moving out. But before that I'd lived in uh, Atwater with these guys and it started out really cool. Spent a year together, like with four guys. They had the downstairs. I had like part of this upstairs loft. And then by the time I left, at, right after my car accident, I was getting texts from them accusing me of witchcraft, which I get it. Like, I seem kind of like the kind of person that might do witchcraft. But then also, like, uh, like making offhanded references to, like, drowning me in the uh, reservoir, the nearby reservoir. And I was like, oh, no, I need to get out of this. I don't feel, I guess I don't feel Were safe. Were they I pilgrims? Feel. What the fuck? I know. I was just sort of like, <laughs> what? I think they meant to send it on, like, another group chain that didn't have me CC'd but accidentally sent it to like the one I was on. So I was like, oh, I should, I should move like tomorrow. So I made two cross country trips in the span of like, I thought it was a year. Eric just reminded me it was in the span of five months. I moved Oof. from LA to New York, then back to, right back to uh, Burbank. Hmm. That is, that is quite the whirlwind. Well, I, I don't have anything past college. It's very interesting, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I had a roommate who used to scratch on the door at inopportune moments. I'll, I'll leave it scratch? at that. Scratch yeah. on the door? Like a cat? Yeah. Yeah. Was it yeah. a cat? No, I, although he acted like one a lot of the time. Oh, my God. Um, uh, you know, there were several instances where the door was shut, and he would scratch on the door, and it was uh, it was not That's a good crazy. situation. That's I know. so creepy. I'm thinking of Always Sunny and the, the, the ex-wife who thinks she's a cat in that show, if you ever watch it. Uh, that's <laughs> well, it was, it would happen a lot when my girlfriend at the time would visit and that would, that would, uh, cause problems. So that was, that was an issue. Um, and then, uh, my roommates, uh, uh never did the dishes. So that pissed me off. Oh my God. That's, yeah. you know, when I, first, uh, when I first moved out to LA, it was because, um, and we'll get to your question, Sandra, in one, uh, moment because we're, we kind of put a side, side turn here, but, uh, my well, we're going to bring it back. We're gonna we'll find a way to circle back. But um, <laughs> I moved out to LA. It was uh, I came here on behest of the Observer, the New York Observer, and I'd come from being married, uh, and before that, living with my sister, and, and and before that, I lived in college with the same person for four years because she was this awesome chick named Emily. We did everything together. Her personality, my personality, could not be more different. Like she was very dry, sarcastic, very like kind of on the shyer side, and I was like this big, crazy, whirling dervish. But we just got on like, you know, sometimes it just works. It doesn't work on paper. And then in person, you're just like, this is the perfect person to live with. Um, but after having been married and then living on my own, going to live with like, you know, a, a house full of people was such an adjustment to make in like my, you know, early to mid 30s. And I realized like at a certain point, 
after all the stuff in Atwater went down, I was moving to New York and then moving back. I was like, you know, I don't think it's me. And I don't think it's the roommates. I think it's the situation. I think it's like the situation we're all being placed in, uh, in this like generation and moving past where it's like, we weren't told that we would be living with strangers past our early thirties. Right. Like we were told like you would have a house and a family and you would own your own house. And we never really like got into the idea that this would be, you know, learn manners or like learn how to like, deal with people who are not your direct family that you would have to tell to do the dishes. You know, there's no, there's not any course in that in home ec or like civics class or whatever. Yeah. It, I think that's very astute. Yeah. So I was like actually writing this uh, for a nonprofit. I was writing this big grant paper about doing a study oh, on it. I... And then COVID, happened. <laughs> then COVID happened and I was like, Oh wow. I feel like this changes the whole dynamic, but also proves my point even more. Uh, that like, you know, roommate situations get really tense really quickly. And there's a tendency to think of people as like, just absolutely like they are crazy and I'm sane. But really, it's just that we just haven't been taught to learn communally with strangers to live communally with strangers past an age where we're told that we would be having our own families or be living by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So Sandra's asking, which of the monkeys would you want to be your roommate? Oh, that ties it back wonderfully, Sandra. Thank you for that. Shoot, Mark. Um, well, <laughs> I think, I think it would have to be Mike. Uh, okay. the reason being that, uh, Peter's very sweet, but he's vegetarian. So I would feel self-conscious about, you know, what I'd be eating for dinner. Uh, Davey got all the girls. And after a while, I'd resent the fact that he'd be, you know, you know, scoring when I wasn't. And, um, you know, Mick. Mickey would be fun, but he'd inevitably bring out his impression of the inimitable James Cagney, and that would <laughs> probably drive me nuts. Whereas um, Mike would be the one who could understand, you know, being funny one minute and mercurial the next, and but and also be uh, prone to doing weird things. Like there's there's a story that. I think Mickey tells in that at the height of their stardom, uh, they were at a party in LA and uh, Mike said, um, I'm, I'm going to go out and get a hamburger. And then he hadn't come back, you know, and then like it like hours later, Mickey was wondering, you know, where Mike had gone. And apparently Mike had gone back to Texas to get that burger. Oh wow! He went to his move. went to his favorite burger joint back in Texas. <laughs> you know what that we call that? We call that a Jeremy Strong move these days. That's a uh, <laughs> so Jeremy Strong. That's really, that was literally a part of the New Yorker profile by Jeremy Strong was him going around the Netherlands looking for like the perfect burger, like for two hours with the journalist being unable to find it, and then being like, "Well, this has something to do about like with loss." And uh, so it was just part of that crazy profile that blew up. Um, what about you, Adam? Which which monkey would you like to live with? Mm, I mean, uh, if pressed, um, I would probably say Peter, um, uh, because I love, uh, uh, folk music and the tradition of folk music. Um, and I know that was his background. Um, I like his, I, I just like his, um, his demeanor, you know, I feel like we'd get along, uh, in that sense. Um, and, you know, um, I, I just I'd be I'd be interested in talking to him about the history of folk music and stuff like that. When we were talking about Mark seeing the monkeys, um, it reminded me that um, one of the concerts I went to a few years ago uh, was the current iteration of the Kingston Trio. And I was easily the, the youngest person there with my friend. Uh, we were the youngest, but uh, we stuck around afterwards and we're able to talk with them. And what's cool about the Kingston trio is they, you know, they've taken over for the original three members, but they did it like one at a time. So like there's a tradition in that group where, you know, of a handing of the baton. And I know the monkeys don't have that, but it's just kind of, I, I like that tradition in folk music. I like uh, talking about the history of it. Mm -hmm. And I could have put that shorter, but that's why I would room with Peter. <laughs> so you move here. Kind of sounds like a mighty. Wind. Are you a big fan of the Mighty Wind? I think, I, I, yeah, Mighty Wind's great. I really, I like all the Christopher Guest stuff, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of that. It nails all the humor 
uh, about folk music so well. Um, yeah, I own that on DVD, digital video disc. <laughs> well, um, I, 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 would, I would quote the uh, lead singer of the, the Del Fuegos who uh, once was uh, saying, you know, all rock is folk music, really, because it's for folks. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything's for folks. I mean, technically, when you think about it. Um, I think I'm going to go, I'm going to be the basic, what they call the basic bitch uh, in this situation. <laughs> Just go with Jv Jones. I mean, he's cute. I like him. He had a really good sense of humor. That's basically all I need in both uh, a roommate or like anyone I spend a lot of time with. And I feel like he wouldn't play that much music like in the apartment for some reason. And I feel like that's that's kind of what I need in a roommate too. Someone who's not going to practice that much. I want you, Davy Jones, and Bill Nighy to do a podcast together. Oh my God, that'd be amazing, right? <laughs> you must be joking. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, so when we talk about the legacy of the monkeys, of course we talk about Shrek because of Daydream Believer. Uh, but, well, you know, what else do you think uh, is their big contribution to pop culture as it stands today? Well, consider that after the monkeys split up, uh, Mike goes off on some really amazing uh, adventures because, you know, he, he starts uh, the first national band and starts playing some really great uh, country, uh, country rock. Uh, uh, the song Silver Moon is a huge favorite of mine, and it, it pops up for just a moment in this uh, early 70s uh, movie Scarecrow with... Uh, Gene Hackman and Al Pacino, mm. and even though you know it's just playing in a diner that they're sitting in, I can't think of that movie without hearing that song. But then, you know, Mike goes off and he starts. You know, he sees the you know the practice of people making music clips for songs that you know initially they're just sending them off to you know variety shows if they can't make a personal appearance, and he says. You know, maybe there's something creative that can be done with it. So he starts making really creative music videos initially when there was no outlet for it. That he did uh, one for uh, the song Rio and another for his song uh, Cruisin', which is awesome because it's shot on uh, Hollywood Boulevard. And the song is about a couple of uh, roller skating chicks who meet up with a bodybuilder and Bond. <laughs> and, and so there's just these... You know, two great looking 70s chicks roller skating down the boulevard. Um, and he got the idea of, well, maybe we could make a show around this. And so he pitched a show called Pop Clips to uh, what was at the time uh, a the cable division of uh, both uh, Warner Communications and American Express. And they, because they had launched uh, Nickelodeon at the time. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they, they're on Nickelodeon so much? And maybe that's well, why? And, you know, shortly after they attempted the series, uh, that's when uh, Warner Amex created MTV. So he, so Nez, Nez was the first guy to realize, hey, you could just program nothing but videos and people will watch them. And then after that, he started a video label called Pacific Arts, and he did the first video album called uh, Elephant Parts, which was a mixture of uh, music videos and comedy sketches and really hilarious stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it was him because uh, he had like a repertory company of players. And one guy he had was a fellow named Sir William Martin, who had previously written some of the songs that the monkeys performed. And they did wild sketches and it won the Grammy the very first Grammy for any kind of video creation. Whoa. I didn't and, even know we give, out, we give out Grammys for music videos. I guess that makes sense. We don't have anything else for them except the MTV awards. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, he got it for the whole album, you know, not just for, you know, one music video, you know, just this, gotcha. this whole concept thing that had never been tried before. And then after that, he goes into film pr producing. He he produces Repo Man. He produces Tape Heads. Uh, huh. uh, he produces uh, Square Dance. He produces uh, Time Rider with uh, Fred Ward. You know, he only he only did four movies, but they're four very diverse and interesting uh, films. And 
you know, when I was a teenager, I was all over Repo Man. And when I got into, when I started college is when Tape Heads came out. And that's one of my favorite movies that really? not enough people know. The one with uh, Steve Buscemi and am I thinking the wrong thing? Was no. It Steve no, no. Uh, it's a t tape heads is John Cusack and Tim Robbins, along with. Oh uh, right! Oh, I do know this one. Yeah, it's like kind of like Night of Roxbury ish. Ooh. Yeah, where they're they're playing uh, nascent music video directors, and it's got a, an amazing uh, company of uh, supporting players in it. It has uh, Clue Gulliger, Susan Tyrell, Don Cornelius from Soul Train, uh, Mary Crosby from Dallas. Uh, the mom from Arrested Development, right? Uh, Jessica Walter? Yes, yes. Yeah. She plays a character named Kay Mart. <laughs> oh, wow. Perfect. Hmm. What's what I'm thinking with Steve Buscemi and Brendan Fraser and... Uh, Airheads. Name, Airheads. Airheads. There we go. Yeah. I was going crazy for a second. That happens to me about 100 times a day. Um, so, so, yeah. so Nez's sense of musical and technical innovation and uh and his sense of humor was you know kind of grew as i was growing and contributed to why i am like this uh mm -hmm. and even even his label uh pacific arts was a home video label for a while and they had some of the really coolest uh tapes out there because they were putting out they were putting out stuff like uh, the Ruddles, My Dinner with Andre. Uh, oh God, that's a name. I, that is a movie I have not heard about in a while. Another, uh, great, yeah. another great Christopher Guest bit, though, is at the end of uh, Waiting for Guffman, where there, where he has the My Dinner with Andre uh, uh, action figures. <laughs> oh, well, let me tell. Oh, let me tell you, um, our our good friend Whitney and, oh, uh, and Whitney yeah. and uh, Bibbs. They launched a podcast earlier uh, oh, yeah. this year yeah, called uh, My Dinner with My Dinner with Andre, where they were having their other podcaster friends watch the film for the first time and give their thoughts. And uh, at that time, I was doing a podcast with the wonderful uh, B. Peterson of uh, the Screen Margins uh, Podcast Ooh. Network. And uh, B. and Whitney now currently do uh, all about Ovid once a month but is at that, that about, time is that Abed from I'm gonna I don't want to guess wrong here so I'll let you tell me Abed from what uh Ovid is a streaming channel that has really deep cut uh movies that most streaming channels won't even go near mm -hmm. so it's like if you're like really Arrow. yeah if you're really into foreign films and you know art house stuff you, you know stuff like you know you know, at yeah, Steffi Bank, gay cowboys eating pudding. Yeah. Then is that Cartman? That is, yeah, I busted out a Cartman. <laughs> wow, you, 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 and my dad, right? I just watched four hours of the, those pandemic specials with my dad in uh, in Santa Barbara today. Hadn't seen South Park probably since the mid '90s, since the movie came out, and I just saw how to get a real big uh, catch up so I could watch it all with my dad. Those pandemic specials are pretty tight. Yeah, but. Mm -hmm. So all about Ovid is a monthly guide to the really cool stuff they have streaming that month that uh, B and Whitney have have watched. But anyhow, uh, uh, B Peterson and I were doing a podcast devoted to the '30s uh, filmmaker Dorothy Arzner, who was uh, way cool. Uh, the only woman director working in the Hollywood studio system in the thirties and also openly gay. Uh, so while we were doing that, we got asked to do my dinner with Andre and uh -huh. I had never actually seen the film, but I, you know, Me you know neither. Gr growing up through that period and watching Siskel and Ebert, it became part of my cultural lexicon and B had never seen it either. So we agreed to do it, but we decided to take it one step further because first off, I suggested that we should also review a parody of My Dinner with Andre called My Breakfast with Blassie that Andy Kaufman had uh, made. What? what? <laughs> I didn't hear about that. <laughs> Andy Kaufman... Uh, had seen my dinner with Andre and I don't know whether he liked it or thought it was pretentious, but 
he got together with uh, a friend of his named Johnny Legend to make uh, a satire of it. And he he was still in character selling the, the injury that Jerry Lawler had given him. So he does the entire movie the with his neck brace. And it's him having breakfast at what used to be the Sambos on Wilshire Boulevard with Freddie Blassie, you know, the, the great wrestling manager. And most of it is completely improvised, but it was on that shoot that Andy met his uh, life companion, Lynn Margulies, who was Johnny Legend's sister. That, you know, Johnny had said, uh, you know, I need some extras for this uh, shoot I'm doing. Will you come to the set and just pretend to be a diner at the restaurant? And in the, in, in the movie, Andy starts hitting on her. And she has no idea who he is. You know, like he says, you know, I'm on taxi. And she thinks, oh, you're a taxi driver. You know, and she's just <laughs> like, no selling his attempts to Mac on her. But they did end up being together. And she was by his side until he died. So I, and I thought, well, let's look at that movie as well as my dinner with Andre and talk about how what kind of kinships they have, because I was making the point that even though it's ostensibly parody, it's also kind of work. It works on its own in that, you know, wrestling is about creating a public persona the same way that in my dinner with Andre, uh, Andre and Wallace are playing the worst version of themselves in mm -hmm. this movie to, you know, that they're based off of who they are, but it's all scripted and, but That's we so and I, then I, I, we I and we went even further. We reviewed earlier episodes of my dinner with my dinner with Andre. Uh, one second, we got this uh, donation saying, "I love that white ass started on MTV." Mike Nesmith used the fortune he inherited from his mother, Bet Claire Nesmith. Oh gosh, that went away. Garth, Garth, I'm gonna have to find that uh, whole thing from you because uh, people can't hear the source. But I think he had a question at the end of it. Uh, so I was a that. big monkeys fan, Mark. He's, uh, he's, he's hardcore. Mm. He grew up with them as well. So, so real quick, uh, we did get a couple more questions in here. Somebody was asking earlier, do you have a favorite monkeys episode? Hmm. Uh, that, well, uh, that's a tough one because, uh, I mean, there, I, there's definitely a few that I I'm constantly referring to that, um, uh, one of my uh, one of my closest friends in LA uh, used to work at a theater with me, and she lived in Orange County. So rather than make the commute, she would crash at my place, and she had bought the entire series on DVD, and you know we'd watch them at the apartment. So there were certain ones that we watched over and over again. Um, so her favorite was Fairy Tale, which is in the second season, and it's really wild because it's done without a laugh track it's uh them uh telling you know they're on a, a barren set with just a few props and they're all in you know elizabethan gear telling uh a fairy tale and mike uh plays two roles he plays himself but he plays a spoiled princess and oh, wow. <laughs> And uh, Mike is really hot as a blonde with sideburns <laughs> and, a a and a conical hat. <laughs> uh, um, what about you, Adam? But, but no, well, I was going to say, favorite. but there's that one. But my personal favorite, I think, is uh, Captain Crocodile, where uh, the guys have uh, lucked into a gig on a kid's show, but the host of the show is jealous of them and keeps trying to suppress them. And I love it because uh, number one, it's got uh, two. Uh, it's got uh, an early performance of Valerie before it was released uh, on vinyl, and it's got uh, so many great gags that I, I I quote constantly. That at one point, when you know the network is deciding whether to let them stay on the show, they all show up in different costumes and Mike comes in as a elder elderly caretaker and says, you know, I got 10 grandkids and they love to watch the monkeys there on that Captain Crocodile show. 
Uh, did you watch the show before the monkeys were on? Oh, I watched it once, watched it for about five minutes, and I thought, <laughs> what am I doing this for when I could be out cleaning garbage cans? <laughs> <laughs> so so I think that's my personal favorite because there's so many jokes that I, I lean on. So, uh, What about you, Adam? Did you have a favorite monkeys episode? Or I guess, you know, let's expand it. We can do my favorite monkeys episode or, or appearance. Well... Yeah, so with me because I I um I've only caught bits and pieces of the show over the years. Mm -hmm. Um uh I'll go with what I know and and to, and to go back um to kind of contextualize things. Um the thing that was really great about their appearance on Boy Meets World was uh like I said Peter played Tavanga's father. Mickey was an old friend of Alan, the dad. Um Ru Russ Taylor, uh, Russ Tamblin? Russ, no, not Russ Tamblin. I, I need to, I need that to look up the, the dad from Boy Meets World. He's he's more of a TV actor. Okay. Anyway, they were old friends in a high school band. But but Davy Jones uh, was this obnoxious character who comes back into the lives of the parents, and his role was he used to be, uh, he was their tour guide in Europe when mm -hmm. on their honeymoon, and. The thing is, he was supposed to just be their tour guide in Britain, but he kept following them from country to country. That's funny. And, and then the, the gag is he shows back up in the United States like 20 years later. And and he just moves into the house for like a weekend and takes over their lives. And it's it's delightful. And then it ends with the, the big musical reunion where the studio audience is applauding them all hopping on stage together. Um, I, I'm going to have to watch that episode because uh, the only modern day thing I could think of off my head was uh, when Davey appeared on My Two Dads. I did not oh, see I, that. I was going to say the Brady, the very Brady movie <laughs> was like my going to be my my appearance that I loved because uh, the, the Brady Bunch movie was so clever. Like I just thought it was it was one of those early examples of like what you know, it was now considered like meta humor. You know, like it was just like hmm. very self-aware, but it still kept like all the all the ambiance, I think, of or like all the heart rather of, of what the Brady Bunch was like supposed to stand for. But with this like, you know, veneer of like, we know that this is like a, a false reality and these characters will be living in that their little bubble while like, in you know, interacting with regular human beings. And it just was a movie that really both the Brady Bunch and the very Brady sequel really did it for me as like a, a young tween. And True. um yeah, I those those movies um, uh, really hold up. It was all they do, say. don't they? I haven't seen them in years, but I bet they yeah. do hold up. Um, I learn all them. Um, somebody saying, uh, real quick in the comments, I see AJ saying Johnny Legend from The Voice, and I don't know if that's true. So, Johnny uh, no, Legend from the Voice? no, John, not John Legend. Um, <laughs> so yes, uh, Davy Jones, his gag is every time he comes on set, he's like, they're like, who are you? He's like, Reg. Reginald Fairfield, and then oh. and then and then and then uh, other characters start repeating his catchphrase uh, from <laughs> throughout the episode, and um, and yes, William Russ. I said Russ Williams. Yeah, sorry, sorry, William Russ. It's been uh, a minute. And it's, it's asking, have you all? Have you all? Y'all? Sorry, sorry, Ferris. Have y'all listened to the Cisco and Ebert podcast about their rise? I'm guessing he means the monkeys. I don't recall that. Cisco and Ebert ever talking about the monkeys. I don't think they. I don't think they would have had a reason to. They were television. Uh, aside or from a podcast about the rise of Cisco and Ebert, I'm. I'm trying to. Ah, that maybe that. that to maybe out, that like, one. Is this on Ebert? Like the brand is still around, right? I like think. I, well, Roger I think RogerEbert.com is. Yeah. Yeah, and, I'm not sure if I did that. No, oh, I wow. think there was a podcast that is devoted to the history of Cisco and Ebert. And so I have episode, not listened to that. Maybe they did an episode about the monkeys. Cause like, how long would that, I mean, that podcast sounds great, but like how many episodes could that possibly take mm -hmm. up before you want to like side tangent on to like, you know, what else was going on during their rise? It's well, I, mean, it's a little spirit well, I mean, the, the only tie I can think that Cisco and Ebert would ever have to the monkeys is if a, they were reviewing one of the movies that Nez yeah. produced or B, you know, Mickey did movies during the 70s, but most of them would have ended up in the Dog of the Week segment. <laughs> okay, so didn't Mickey, I looked this up earlier, didn't Mickey direct a live action version of Aladdin that like disappeared? Like, I, I he directed a live action Aladdin in like the late 80s, early 90s, 
that was produced by Disney and just vanished into the ether. And Barry Bostwick played the genie. I think I think that is very possible because uh, when the band broke up, Mickey had married a British woman and moved to England and was directing series television for many years. So it's very so it's entirely possible that he would have gotten a directing gig doing something on the level of uh, a Disney Channel project. Because uh, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff of, from Disney Channel that is impossible to come by. Uh, Tim Burton did an amazing, uh, I think it was Hansel yeah, and did. Gretel for yeah, Disney I Channel. Say, yeah, and it's did, never like, whole, been seen. That was like a kid's, wasn't it like a show? Like kind of like that Shelley Duvall or Shelley Duvall. It was a Shelley Duvall kind of, or no, Shelley Yeah, Duvall. the Shelley Duvall fairy tale theater. But yes, I don't think, there we go. but I don't yeah. think he but I don't think he did an episode of fairy tale theater. I no, think this was something like in that vein for Disney mm -hmm. channel. And they right. like either never aired it or only aired it once. Yeah, no, I, 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 I love fairy tale theater. Um, um, I, love I, that used, stuff up. I used to have the box set DVDs of all the episodes. Now um, I want to Google fairy tale theater. I really oh God. Yeah, no, that, that like, like Shelly, Shelly Duvall, like that was, that was kind of like her therapy, like post The Shining. Yeah. That yeah, and Suburban it. Commando. I, I saw her in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh sh that's right. Sh I think Francis Ford Coppola directed an episode. Yeah, no, wait, Tim Burton did direct an episode. Oh, he did direct mm -hmm. an episode of Fairy Tale Theater, but I don't yeah. think Hans, was Hansel and Gretel the one? Let's see, let's see, let's see. I'm trying to see now which, uh, which episode it would be. Well, they did six seasons of it. It might take me a second to find it. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, Hansel Gretel was Arthur Rackman. He did it. Um, okay, no, because he, oh, he. But. Oh no, no, sorry. He did the art for it. Rather, never mind. Let's see. Yeah, I'm gonna see. Eric Idle was on an episode. Um, oh, he narrated it. Eric Idle narrated it. Man, I need to rewatch this movie. This or the show. It seems amazing. You have the box set of it. You said. Uh, I Adam? used to. Um, I have it. It, it was. Uh... It is no longer my possession, but I I'm looking into getting a new a new set. Yeah, if you were an '80s or a '90s kid between uh, Fairy Tale Theater and Mother Goose's Rock and Rhyme, uh, Shelley Duvall was like uh, your your best babysitter ever. Yeah, yeah, and you know you know what's crazy for me, Mark, is I grew up with Fairy Tale Theater um, uh, first, and then I saw The Shining. You know, at a young age, but still after fairy tale theater. So seeing Shelley Duvall go through that after being the host of fairy tale theater was a lot. Oh yeah, no, it's um, it's. So I found it. Uh, Tim Burton did an uh, an episode. Oh, uh, Tim Burton did an episode of Aladdin and his wonderful lamp. Okay, so he did that, and Mickey Dolenz did the movie that no one knows about with Barry Bostwick playing the genie. Oh yeah, wait, wait. So the cast of this one was James Earl Jones. Leonard Nimoy, Robert Carradine, uh, mm. Shelley Duvall, um, and then Gina Rollins and Jeff Bridges. Was this on the same episode? I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna tell you right now, Drew. We need to do a whole episode about fairy tale theater. God, this was. We one need to episode. do a devoted episode because, like, there's Damn. so much. Like, there, so many amazing people were on that show. Yeah, just this one episode. Jeannie was James Earl Jones. Leonard Nimoy was the evil magician. Robert Carradine was Aladdin. Joseph Mar was a Sultan. Uh, that's an amazing cast right there. That is just an amazing cast. And then it was directed by Tim Burton. Incredible. Incredible, guys. We will get to that uh, one of these times. Let's, somebody, let's see. Let's okay, yes. Uh, the, the, it was the Hansel and Gretel that Tim Burton did was for Disney Channel. They aired it once, and it's never been seen since, except at like museum retrospectives. So he got around. <laughs> I... I was just going to say the one that I remembered as well was uh, Rip Van Winkle with Harry Dean Stanton. And that was the one directed by Coppola. Yeah. Uh, that Van was Winkle. the cover one? Yeah. Uh, um, so, oh God, they're so good. I'm trying to think now, like, I'm, I'm trying to find an exact one I have in my head. There's a Robin Williams one, right? Or am I crazy? Mm. Am I crazy? Uh, yes, there is. The Frog Prince. Is it Prince and the Pauper? I think or, it's the Frog Prince one. Oh yeah, that would make sense. Maybe? It's a Prince one. Yeah, it's one of the Prince ones. Um, okay, guys. So I, I guess you know, with this, uh, with having you seen the very final 
performance of the monkeys uh live pretty recently um and that's kind of wrapping up here what are your sort of uh you know final takeaways having been at that last show about you said it was like more joyful than it was sad but you know it's, it's sort of bittersweet to, to have this kind of remembrance of, of somebody who's just recently passed because they're doing these kind of hard times so what would you like you know what would you like to impart on a new a new group of kids who might be listening to uh the monkeys or looking at this kind of side eyes going why would i listen to the monkeys uh today <laughs> well uh they that the monkeys um you know we we went on so many tangents you know yeah, yeah. One, one of the things i wanted to talk about as to why are we like this is that the, the monkeys were a gateway not just to a uh, great uh, music by others, you know, again, you know, the monkeys songs were written by Carol King, Neil Diamond, Boyce and Hart, Harry Nilsson, uh, 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 John, John Stewart, who, uh, who wrote, who later did, uh, John Stewart wrote daydream believer. And then he had his one big hit song was gold in 1978. Not but John then, Stewart, like the guy from The Daily Show, right? That'd be no, I didn't want to have and, to go and not to not the Green Lantern. No, okay. no, not that one either. <laughs> uh, but then also in terms of comedy, the the monkeys had such great rapid fire stuff that paved the way for me to discover stuff like the Marx Brothers or uh, uh, you know the '30s screwball comedy, and then you know. You know, Bob Rafelson and Burt Schneider went on to produce some of the most important films of the early 70s, like Five Easy Pieces and The Last Picture Show. And and then you've got all, all of it, it, just all of these different directions that emerge from this wonderful, funny, friendly little television show that you were asking about earlier about, you know, Beatles versus monkeys. And I would, I would put forth that when, when I was growing up, I mean, everything was in the shadow of the Beatles, but it wasn't easy. You know, there was no home video. So you had to wait around for maybe hard days night to play on television or get a theatrical revival. And then the movies went out of circulation for a long time. I mean, maybe if you listened to oldies radio, you would hear them, but, you know, the monkeys were on television almost all the time. You know, yeah. even though they didn't have that many episodes, you could and you 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 could only run it like during the summer before you hit uh, reruns. You know, they were they were on television. They were on MTV back in the eighties. So you could you could see them. They were more readily accessible in terms of seeing their faces and hearing their songs. And so. I would say to uh, the the to the side eyeing young people, uh, which uh, I I am addicted to first time reaction videos uh, on on YouTube. You know, people listening to stuff for you know or movies. And mm -hmm. now you know you can have a healthy bit of skepticism about whether this is you know their stuff is real. I mean, most of them you have page. Most of them have Patreons, which means it's kind of, you know, the cultural equivalent of, uh, you know, dan dancers at the go-go bar. You know, yeah. Okay, wow. here's here's $40. I'll tell you that Kansas it doesn't suck. So, uh, <laughs> but... Or it's a better model for the future of uh, capitalism where we do direct-to-consumer entertainment and don't bother with the studio middleman. You can make an argument either way. Well... Well, the, well, the point is, is that, you know, people, people in their 50s desperately want their, their cultural totems to be validated by the new generation. So, uh, uh, I see. so you're almost talking more like the cameo situation where it's like, I'll pay you to, to say this out loud and uh, make a little video saying this is the best thing, the, the monkeys are the best. Yes. But that being said, I have watched enough reaction videos of people experiencing the monkeys for the first time. And I, you know, I believe in it. I mean, anybody, you know, put day, put the video of Daydream Believer in front of someone where they midway through they've given up any pretense of act, act, you know, accurately trying to look like they're playing the song and just goofing around with each other and having a good time. And 
you know, that you want to live in that music video because at the core, it's four guys having a really great time being around together. And oh, and they're singing a really damn happy song, too. Yeah. As uh, Jeremy Strong might put it uh, in a New Yorker profile, what the Shrek just happened? Uh, because I feel like that's that's it's 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 the monkeys and Smash Mouth that have, have gotten I feel like a resurgence for the younger kids about uh, from from the Shrek franchise. So yeah, well, I mean, Smash Mouth did its purpose, but when people listen to the original "I'm a Believer" about you know by with Mickey on it. Uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, Neil Diamond's gospel fervor, you know, coming into play, you know, they're realizing, oh, you know, this is the one. You know, okay. Th thank you for the introduction, Smash Mouth. You can go now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someone's saying Valerie's my favorite song. Is that the same Valerie that was covered by, uh, what's her name? Um, oh, God, what is her name? She she died a couple of years ago. You're not I'm thinking of Amy Winehouse's Valerie? Amy Winehouse's Valerie. The one I, don't, I don't think so. Valerie. No. No, okay. um, I know that no. was a cover. I was going to say I one of, one of the songs I used to play on repeat when I uh, first started listening to the Monkees as a young fellow was "Last Train to Clarksville." I would listen to that a lot. I just love the opening riff of the song, and I and and I just I love the energy of that song, and it was one I would like to play on repeat. And that um, is a brilliant song because mm -hmm. you know it sounds like this bouncy peppy thing, but. It is about a soldier going to Vietnam, calling his girlfriend, saying, "Yo, I don't think I'm gonna make it back. Yo, you'd better nice. come see me because I'm about to go get killed." Mm -hmm. and, oh God, and, that's dark. And it's so upbeat. Scor and Scorsese yeah, like uses uh, "Last Train to Clarksville" in After Hours, and it is, I think, possibly that's, the best that's use right, of monkey right. music in a movie because much like. The way that song is deceptive about how peppy and happy it is, uh -huh. it's being played by Terry Garr's character, who later reveals just how dangerous she really is. And mm -hmm. it's just this beautiful meta moment. Oh, my favorite of those is uh, not, not the same, of course, is at the end of uh, All That Jazz, you know, the Bob Fosse pseudo documentary mm -hmm. that uh presciently predicted his own death uh that that end scene that whole end segment where they're doing the everly brothers bye bye love but it's bye bye life and it's this mm -hmm. huge gigantic pro uh production with ben mm -hmm. Vereen and roy schneider and it looks like like it looks like uh the in it's like a technicolor all like lit up but it's like the uh a human body with the blood pumping and everything and then there's john lithgow in the audience everyone he's ever known and at the end it just hard cuts to the body bag being zipped up Devastating, devastating use of a very like upbeat song. Mm -hmm. but that's uh, my thing of it. Um, so to to sort of wrap this up, uh, Adam, you had something we wanted to bring up today. It's kind of a hard left, but I did want to make sure that we had time for it this evening. Uh, this is Drew taking pity on me because I'm unreasonably no, obsessed so with this video. No, okay. Here's the thing. I don't know that people are going to get much out of it because this video is really all about the song. I okay. want to at least queue it up so people know how to find it and then they okay. can listen to it on their own. We don't want to get copyright issues or whatever. You know um, what? I'm not. I think we can play it. I think we can play a couple seconds of this song. I just Let's want people to get a taste. You know what? The worst they can do is flag us for non um, monetization and then we'll, I can just cut around it. So, you know what? Screw it. Adam, why don't you queue up what this, what, what this is we're about to watch? Look, um, this is something. Um, I really like um, regional commercial jingles that get mm -hmm. carried away. So like when, when, when a local business goes all in on their ad and they try and get super creative and they take it too far. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know where this store is from. I don't know when this was recorded, but these people really committed to their premise of, of doing some, kind of hip hop jingle to raise awareness of their pawn shop or whatever it is. I think it's um, a curious, like a little tchotchke shop that also yeah. sells. It must be the side of the road thing. Well, we'll see. We'll see why. That, that it you speaks can, like, for itself. It speaks for itself. So this is called Selling is Service. You might've already seen this. It's yeah. been around from 2017 and it has, uh, almost, it has 800,000 views. So there's a chance. There's a chance you might've seen it. Uh, let me cue it up. Um, Mark, do you, do you know what this is? The Selling is Service song? Uh, sounds 
Sounds vaguely familiar, but I can't place it. But, you know, maybe okay. I'll, within seconds, yeah. it was like, oh, that. So, I'll warn uh, you right now, there are no monkeys. There's no monkeys, but there is something uh, quite glorious in it. I do want to say uh, sorry in advance if this is, you know, something that uh, gets un not unmonetized. It, that gets, uh, you know, gets us in a little bit of trouble. But I think I think Adam's right. This is this is worth it. Uh, OK, so let's get this up. Hold on. And it's I'll also make it so screen. crappy. I don't know that like any algorithm would pick this up, but let's see. Let's see. So here we go. Let me do it by the Chrome tab. Actually, here we go. There we go. So if you guys can see, guys, get ready for something Adam loves so much, crappy regional commercials, and the song <laughs> Selling is Service. Crappy regional commercials. Yeah. Selling is service. And service is selling. Service is selling. And selling is service. <laughs> This guy. Right. I'm buying all these products with oh so much delight. I can help you find anything you could possibly want. Such ostentatious goodies that I can flaunt. Selling in service. The choreography service would, would make service. Jerome Robbins blush. Selling. And selling is service. That's it. They got some moves. This must be one regional store. You're right. It's not like a always big beezing and doozing, never cheesing or choosing. Hello always there. beezing and doozing, never cheesing or choosing. I'm in a good <laughs> mood and it's here to oh, stay. Oh God, I've got <laughs> here, here to stay. stay. The here to stay is just how you I'll know it's a rhyme that over. like I've got plenty older of person made up. That. Hello there, sir. I got some. All right, for reindeer you. antlers. Your Pay attention to her. This woman is the best. Be here by two. <laughs> service is sell. Selling is service. Service is sell. Selling yeah. is service. Service is selling. Fighting and challenge and part. challenge and okay. fighting. This is my favorite part right here. This guy. Oh, this, this guy, guy is, is amazing. My name is Jill and I don't like to sell. Reading from her script. I'm an unhappy person. Everyone can go to heck. Complain, complain <laughs> that all I like to do. Hello there, Jill. They call me Happy Pete. I Happy Pete sounds so to buy so bad. Happy, yeah, there was a comment that said Happy Pete has to stay ten feet away from every school. <laughs> you look so unhappy that you. I'm so glad this is subtitled. It's I won't so buy helpful. as much because now I feel bad. Yeah, people are feeling this. Service. And service is selling. Oh my god, where did he come from? Yeah, someone selling calls the service. cops on Happy Pete. Oh my god, this. Oh god, oh god. These random people who just pop up and never come back are oh also my god, that really was, great. How about they kept that in. She just fell. In Jade, if you buy this Usyk, you'll so, have it made. <laughs> buy this so Usyk. Yeah, what's an Usyk? And shirts uh, yeah, what kind of Dr. Seuss nonsense is this? <laughs> I don't know, but look, look, look what they sell. It's like creepy dolls, ba baby stuff, but then also so tchotchkes, and then I feel look like branded shirts. Stuff. Who cares if I should? It's selling. It is Here they come again. And Here they're coming right it's towards selling. you, haunting service your dreams. Is selling. And selling is service. Okay, people are loving that. Adam, maybe we should put on the other one that you really love. Montgomery Mini Mall? Please. Please. Yeah, you know what, guys? Montgom Sorry in advance if we get demonetized from this. Okay. But, uh, All right. Yeah. No, Montgomery Mini Mall is a masterpiece with yeah. its Dutch angles and quick zooms. So we got to check that out. And it's shorter than that. So I do want to I do want to read a couple of the clutch comments from there, uh, from the comment section, because it's amazing. Lou's and Usix. Somebody <laughs> goes, Bill is my hero. She understands the unhappiness. Yeah. <laughs> everyone can go to heck. Yeah, yeah, everyone can go to heck. Somebody said Jill could have at least learned her lines. And somebody said she could have. I don't know. I think she could have. She doesn't give a heck. And someone goes, she feels <laughs> sick. And someone goes, hello there, Jill. They call me Happy Pete. When I go to the school, they call the police. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about police. right. I yep. want to see a version of this song like covered by Cannibal Corpse or something. I like, love this. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody says, 
Happy Pete is one in over 10 country. Someone else said, who else relates to Jill on a spiritual level? Yeah. Kudos especially, to every... if, especially having to read her lines from a script. I relate to that too. Someone's saying, let's go make a fun, a go fund me to make this a Super Bowl ad. <laughs> yeah, and someone says immediately well, there's a death, there should be a death metal metal well, version of this. And okay. two years later, we must all admit there's a great use of the word ostentatious. That's Mm. Well, it, it, it occurred to me th this isn't an ad. What it is, this is a training video for their employees that's, that's to exactly tell right. them. Yes. To tell, yeah, yeah, because it's like, oh, see, if you're upsetting, 100%. nobody's going to buy from you. And so you're absolutely right. It's just it's like in that larger like uh, oeuvre of of, mm -hmm. of regional shittiness. Um, you are absolutely right. But you are completely right. This was not yeah, supposed that, to be seen yeah. by the general public. This is a training video. That was my first thought. William Harold with weren't those the two at the end of Mahal and Tribe? <laughs> oh god. Oh that yeah, just just the happy old couple in the uh, car. What's what's <laughs> Ulu's and Usix? I have no idea. I, here's I, the last yeah. one. Let's see, okay. here's the last one. Guys, uh, strap like, yourselves in because this is this is this something is amazing. else. Oh. This oh. is like what they make fun of on adult swim, but I feel like they never really even get to how good this is. There is one I want to show you after this that we'll probably get. This to one's going to be this one's going to be in your head. This one this one oh, goes th on. This one I am well aware. <laughs> okay, let's see, let's see. This one I believe uh yeah, does go on for approximately 19 years, so we will we will get through this together, guys. This is Montgomery Mall. So, uh I got to say put, though. Somebody by the way, the first comment says uh the first comment says says uh as a person who lives in montgomery it is ju it's just like a mini mall <laughs> so that's just true uh, well thank you for indulging me drew because <laughs> i those songs haunt my dreams i've watched those videos for years somebody just said uh, well okay this well it's longer than it is and someone's like i think it's going on for six minutes it's just like a mini mall <laughs> somebody's going hey, hey it's not it's not long enough uh, I just remembered this one thread. It says, like, I wish to develop a musical from it, saying, I wish it was longer. It feels like five minutes at least. The first 20 seconds are an eternity. <laughs> it's abnormally long. <laughs> Whilst in metaverse mode, let Charlotte, Charlotte Church weave in your mouth and get 100,000 artists. As a furniture, former furniture store over, I watched this ad for years. It's 2021. I'm still loving it. Great marketing idea. I'd be happy if this was an unskippable YouTube ad. I... Perfect. I, I think people need to be educated on what precisely a mini mall actually is. Please. <laughs> well, I think this was a, but I think it was a mini mall. I think that was just one section of the flea market. So let's is see. Is it a mini mall? Is it a flea market or is it a furniture store? Okay. So Montgomery, uh, it's called Curse Commercials. Uh, so it was, now, it's flea not market closed, Montgomery. It's just like a mini mall where we sell I'm looking up sectionals. Our advisor, guys. I'm looking it up. It says uh, there is three floors of choice kitsch and near antiques at excellent prices. Everything is at a discount. I guess the question is, is there food, right? Because that's what we're making a mini mall. And are there Ulus and Usics? Is there Ulus and Usics? But to be, to be clear, a uh, a mini mall, that's the outdoor mall, right? Those little, those little outdoor malls. Or is there another definition for what a mini mall technically is? Like a strip mall is not a well, mini mall, right? No, I think a strip ball does uh, count as a mini mall. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'm not sure because uh, not to like pull rank here, but uh, Jim Rouse in created my town that I grew up in, Columbia, Maryland, and he was famous for creating the world's first outdoor uh, shopping mall, otherwise known as a as a strip mall. So uh, I think a mini mall might be a technical. Well, guys, there might be a technical difference between them, guys. A, I'm. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I just looked up Usyk. Yeah. What is it? Drew, Drew, just do me a favor and Google Usyk. O O S I K. Please tell Maybe me there's two like Usyks. Ugh. Oh my God! No, this can't be right. This can't be right. This can't be right. <laughs> An Usyk is a Native American culture that describes the bacula of a walrus, otherwise known as a penis of a walrus. Used so, for not handles of knives and other tools. No, this is exactly they meant like the knife, but it yeah. is a, uh, it is a penis from uh, a. And here I was. I thought it was just a slur for people from Uzbekistan. Oh my god! Um, 
Oh boy. So that's what they're singing about in that song. I guess well, it's a handle for a knife, but it is well. Ulu Ulu's a knife too, I think. Okay. So they 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 sell a lot of weaponry there. So United States Congressman from Alaska Don Young is known for possessing an 18-inch Wallace Usik, Walrus Usik, and once brandished it like a sword during a congressional hearing. Great, <laughs> wonderful. That Go is uh, that has a whole different context for that training video. Mark, um, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> oh Sorry. wait. Uh, what? What? Uh, do what? Do I think about what? The the video about, or the about uh, the, Ulu's the, and the, Usix? The, yeah, the Usix thing <laughs> just slipped in there. Uh, Ulu's and Usix. Uh, you know, it just it, it, it sounds like uh, something uh, the Who's manufacture when the the, the Grinch <laughs> is away. Uh. I think I thought Ulu's was uh, uh this person. I thought this was Ulu's. Uh, <laughs> let's see. I, you know I where know. I'm going with this. You know where I'm going with this. I thought this was uh, Ulu. Ulu Grossbard, the great director of uh, Straight Time. I thought this was Ulu. That's her name. She's a Twi'lek. I mean, I understand that she... I, I Alu or she's Ulu. <laughs> but her name's Ulu. So. <laughs> Is that, are you doing your cantor service? Is that your High Holy Days? Uh, uh uh, well, no, that's my uh, Ofrahaza tribute. <laughs> um, all right. Can I, while we have Mark here, can I just ask, because I watched this today. Mark, have you seen Bloodbeat? Uh, no, I have not, unfortunately. But okay, I, so I am familiar with that of which you speak. I finally watched it today because I saw it pop up on Twitter. And I was like, I've been mean to see this. And it, it's on Tubi and Shudder right now. Mm -hmm. Completely bananas. I won't spoil anything um about like like big events but the basic premise uh is it's a christmas technically a, a holiday horror movie about um a young man bringing his girlfriend home to visit his family in wisconsin and then they all start getting attacked by the ghost of a samurai uh what's it called it's called blood beat and it's incredible uh, and they amazing. they only use public domain classical music for the score and they go completely nuts with it, and it's just like constant, like constant dramatic classical music, uh, including like stuff like Oh Fortuna. It's it, it, it's Oh Fortuna. Wow, deep cut. Definitely check it out. Um, but uh, just uh, wanted to put it out there because I watched I it today, and it was it was it was madness. It was wonderful. Here's what I want to ask: Do we trust? That uh, this store, this this uh, the one before the mini mall, that this training video isn't actually like just some dark. You know, I'm not saying this is like some skew level conspiracy here, but just if this is what they were actually singing about with Happy Pete, it's that's that's a nubla. That's why are you selling that next to your tchotchkes, haunted dolls, what have you? And your well, that's an that's that's like that's like a some kind of uh, uh, knife tool, that's, and then we've got Ula. the. That's Ulu, and then we got the Usik, which is the the walrus penis knife handle oh thing. God, I can't with that. I can't with that. Now there is one more I want to show you. This one we definitely will get uh, flagged and demonetized for, but I do want to show this to you guys on camera because Adam has never seen this. It's the you guys might have. It's the uh, the foot massage and barbecue uh, video. This was a parody video. Okay. By the way. Okay. And this guy, and this is kind of like I think where we'll end it for the evening. Um, by the way, Mark, real quick, did the monkeys ever have anything to do with Firesign Theater, or am I just like conflating what I used to know in my head um, about two different time periods? Uh, they themselves did not have any direct interactions with Firesign Theater that I know of, mm -hmm. but I think you know, in individually, like uh, I mean, like Mickey Dolans did a lot of cartoon voices, and so did Proctor and Bergman, uh, so they might have you know crossed paths that way. Um, yeah, I think there might, uh, there, I, I can't think of any direct connection, but I would not rule it out either. Oh, oh, let's see. Hold on. I might've found something and just by a quick Google, uh, they hooked up with former monkey night, Michael Ness, Ness specific art video and a Japanese company to produce a project that was to be the first ever interactive video. Oh yes. Uh, well, no. Yeah. Nez, uh, cause I was saying Pacific arts video had really great releases especially comedy because they were doing uh, you know uh, a lot of British stuff a lot of uh, stuff like uh, a concert film by the committee and one of the things they put out was uh, Nick Danger and the case of the missing yoke which was yes. the first comedy yes. Uh, yes. video 
By the way, guys, if you don't know what Firesign Theater was, it's the 70s version of like a uh, Tim Heidecker sort of adult swim style uh, irreverent. Com I mean, just out there comedy, just absurdism and crazy. But it was hilarious, especially if you were on LSD. Well, it was uh, it was styled like a 30s radio drama, yeah. but uh, with uh, a 70s uh, head sen sensibility. And you yes. know, there's a lot of yeah, iconic sketches and characters that came out of it, particularly Nick Danger and his nemesis, Rocky Rococo. I just remember the one about the eggs. About like they're in everyone's eggs, sir. Like I don't, I don't remember any other context for that, but they were eating eggs and they were like, "Oh my hey, god, science yeah. high! It's gone." <laughs> yeah. Um. So this is the last video I'm going to play for you guys. Living room, bedrooms, students. Oh yeah. Um. This you one can is find a. Them. This one is a satire video, but this guy blew up. I mean, this video has. Let's see. This video has. Oh my god. Where, where is the uh, subscriber? Like, oh my god! I'm trying to see all the uh, all the things they have for it. I can't see the exact numbers. All I can see is it has twenty three uh, thousand comments. So like it's seven hundred twenty five k likes. So that's that's big. That's a lot of subscribers. So <laughs> I'm going to play this final video to send us off. This guy is my personal hero. Here we go. Joe's barbecue flip the side. Joe's barbecue flip the side. You better come down here, get some of this shit. You like to eat? America loves to eat. So why not open up somewhere America can sit down, enjoy a meal, and get your feet rubbed? We'll fry anything you want for $5.99. As long as it's fried or edible, we're going to make it delicious. We will fry parts of the chicken you didn't even know was fried. The beef, the feathers, we'll fry candy bars. All that European stuff that you don't really normally eat. Good ass barbecue. Now we'll fry some other than what they normally fry. Guess what you're going to get? Nothing. If it's in the dough, I put it in the fry. Yo, this is dinosaur. All I need is chicken tenderized to the optimum delicious. We got five dinosaurs. Dinosaur. 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 Mark my sympathize here. I grew up in rural Ohio where things like that would not be outside the realm of possibility. I believe yeah. this guy is from Ohio. He's uh, yeah. very funny. He's uh, he's Toby Jones, I think is his name. He was he was working in a prison as a prison guard when this came out. Uh, and this sort of catapulted him into like this comedy circuit. And he's great. He's another mm -hmm. great one about uh, the uh, big trucks. He does a big truck one. Mm. He's amazing. Incredible. 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 Uh, he does, uh, yeah, Jones Big Ass Truck Rental and Storage, Jones Cheap Ass Prepaid Legal and Daycare Academy, 3.3 million views. So I'm going to put the link right here if anyone wants to watch his stuff, and I will try to clip it out and time code it. And if we get in trouble for playing it, we're so sorry. You're really funny, Toby. Uh, we love you. Um, yes. Uh, so I think that's going to be... I think it for the evening, guys. Thank you so much for, for coming on, Mark. I know we could talk forever about a million different things. Um, we did Sondheim a, a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago, but uh, you know, in honor of, of, of his passing, I know you were a big Sondheim fan who would uh at the new Bev do the blog and 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 rework some of Sondheim's lyrics to fit into uh, your current uh of what you guys are playing. Well, I would specifically like you use Sondheim to sell uh, events involving uh, female vampires and exploitation films. Probably never intended for his stuff to be repurposed for, but you yeah, know that was just a show. It. That was the show that I contain multitudes. <laughs> I I love that, but I feel like he would have appreciated that. Quite honestly, um, is I there would like to think so too. Where is there a link we can find uh, to copies of that? 
to the blogs or like or to the articles that were like uh, that. Hold- I remember you sent me one once and it was so good. Uh, here, uh, let me try and pull those up uh, real quickly for you. And I see like Whitney. I love that you and Whitney are running the new Bev blog. That makes me really happy. <laughs> or like, well, we're before. well, we're not running it. We're not just, running it, uh, but, you know, our stars of it. Um, yes, uh, we we have the joy of writing for it on a regular basis. So real quick, we are wrapping up, but I, I forgot about the song. So, you know, okay, what, there's what one. And... Um, I want to ask, you know, did you have a favorite Sondheim number show, Mark? Uh... Oh, that no, that well, that's a tough one because uh, I mean, I I've only. Uh, consumed a certain amount of Sondheim. So I, I don't want to cite one and then suddenly, you know, have to re- retract it later. But um, let, let's just say whenever I hear Oh no. Uh, Tom Waits covering in a puddle of tears. So, sorry, say again. You broke up for a second. Oh, um, that uh, if whenever I hear uh, Tom Waits covering somewhere, I'm in a puddle of tears. Oh, God. <laughs> I really liked how they did that in the new movie. I really, I thought that was mm-hmm. great. Uh, oh, yes. Rita. Like, I, A plus on that. Um, yeah, I, I, these days I'm in really into Merrily. We roll along. I just feel like that show never got its due. Uh, oh, uh, that, that would be my second. Uh, Feinstein uh, singing uh, Old Friends. Mm. I like Franklin Shepherd Inc. because it is a fast paced, my favorite kind of uh, musical song. It is a business song about working business creative relationships and how hard they are to pull off. And it just got that Sondheim, like, you know, do, 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 do. And then it's just like somebody kind of just rapid fire, just giving an internal monologue. That or not getting married today, which was uh, my favorite song to sing right before my wedding. It's uh, neurotic, just sort of cycling cyclical thoughts, intrusive thoughts mm-hmm. in song form. Um, Mark, to send us off, you know, where can we find you, and, and what's your sort of uh, final final thought on the monkeys, where we are right now in in popular culture? Anything you want? Okay, well, uh, oh, no. uh, first off, uh, you can find uh, my handle is at t h e underscore h o y k. The phonetic pronunciation of my. Uh, you can also. Uh, visit my blog, which is uh, The Projector Has Been Drinking, and that is yes. at projectorhasbeendrinking.blogspot.com. Uh, I just uh, Tom, Tom Waits cover. Uh, Tom Waits cover. Uh, I, I just wrote a uh, couple of essays I'm very proud of. One, a uh, deep dive into Last Night in Soho, and before that, a... Uh, a com- oh. an unlikely person between... Uh, once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and the uh, 70s uh, adult roughy uh, Hot Summer in the City. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there is uh, the podcast that I did with uh, B. Peterson called uh, Dance, Dorothy Dance, about uh, the films of Dorothy Arzner, and that can be found at uh, the Screen's Margins uh, podcast network. And uh, and yes, I do periodically write for uh, the, new, the New Beverly, and that is... Uh, Th- those works can be found at thenewbev.com slash blog. Uh, if you want to put in the private chat a link so we can find the Dance Dorothy Dance thing, because be, I would be very interested in seeing that. And I know I'm going to have to go back and uh, add some of this in to uh, the show notes because there's, there's just so much there. Guys, I put in the comment section the new Bev uh, uh, blog that might uh, and that, uh, on the monk- for- okay. So I would do Oh, uh, and as uh, my last uh, word on the monkeys would be uh, the last word that uh, Mike always had during uh, the second season: save the Texas prairie chicken. <laughs> and you know he meant it. Um, <laughs> Adam, how about how about you? Uh, where can we find you besides tomorrow? I know where we can find you, uh, and and all the stuff. <laughs> Well, Mark inspired me. I don't do much. I haven't done much on my blog in a long time, but I put my link. Uh, in there, I wrote a think piece on the weekend at Bernie's Films uh, a couple yes. years ago, and and we will do a whole weekend at Bernie's episode one day. Um, oh yeah, but, we're gonna do a quiz on both of them. You're not. Oh the yes. Oh that. oh god. Oh I know. I know Robert. 
Montagna. Chance. Wants that. I think Chance has asked for it. I will. I will stop Chance in the ground with Weekend at Bernie's. But <laughs> all right. So um, anyway, this little blog I put up is about the Weekend at Bernie's movies. Read it if you like, and if you want more, I'll write more. But read Mark's stuff first because he's been doing it longer. Um, other than that. Oh, Whoa. they're coming to get you. Yeah, coming to get you, Mark. Run. <laughs> oh, I, that it. was but, that was my ride. <laughs> that was such great timing. Right Bring behind it up again. Bring yeah. Up again. Um, all I was gonna say is, yeah, tune in tomorrow because me and Ace Cabrera, we're gonna duke it out over everyone's favorite Matrix movie, The Matrix Revolutions. You say um, that, but it is my favorite Matrix movie. I, the Matrix I Revolution honestly, is the best one. I love all the Matrix movies. Uh, I, I have no shame that I enjoy Matrix Revolutions. I just know most people are kind of hard on it. That was. The oh, joke. I'm so sorry yeah. that a horror version of the Matrix involving a Geiger-esque baby coming out. Like, I'm sorry that that's not your cool version of the Matrix. That is the best Matrix movie. Just I really me. like Matrix Revolutions. I can't wait to go hard on this quiz, and yeah. me and Ace are going to bring it. So tune in. Yeah, that's 7 p.m. tomorrow, guys. You're on this channel. I always forget to do the, this, the plugs here, but please like and subscribe. Press that bell so you can get notified about when we go live and also when we go live on shows where we're not supposed to go live like we did earlier today. I'm Video Drew. Oh, I should put the little banner back up. Uh, you can find me at uh, anything backslash Video Drew, patreon.com backslash Video Drew. That's always helpful. We do fun things like study sessions, but you also get extra little perks here and there and uh, why are we like this we do every other saturday live in the dark with video drew uh is usually what we do here sundays uh we're gonna be bringing that back soon uh, we do the video chronic pop culture quiz and please check out our new um uh podcast network content candy uh, it's nom nom for your ears spelled like content but tastes like candy so uh, that's over. You can find that on iTunes, like Stitcher, all the all the places. Uh, if you go to anchor at dot uh, fm backslash video drew, you can also find it. It has shows like Garmin Shosia, the show that I have with Lon Harris, which sounds like it's very Twin Peaks based, but it's actually about whatever we want it to be about. Um, I know we're doing a Chucky episode and uh, some yeah. other stuff on uh, we're recording tomorrow. And there's a recent one up. It was really fun. Uh, there's also the Video Chronicles, and a new show that me and Eric have started called <laughs> Salty Popcorn Reviews. Get it? Because it's like content candy, nom nom, but then also salty popcorn reviews. So we're doing Spider-Man. It's not all salt. There's some like kettle corn in there. But uh, it's uh, we're going to be doing one about the new Spider-Man movie. So spoilers ahoy for that one. Uh, I had so many thoughts. And without giving anything else away, I will say so many thoughts about the college admission process in the MCU. I do not understand how that works. Um, and otherwise guys, uh, yeah, check me out here. Check me out on Twitter. Everything is backslash video drew. And if you want, you can check into the show that I've been writing for, uh, Rotten Tomatoes. If you have Roku or Peacock, check out an OT, like an OTT. So it's, you, you kind of have to just get it when the, when it's cycling through the, you know, content that they're putting out as like, you know, time programming show called RT essentials that I have written with Lon Harris for the past year and a half. Um, really fun show it's kind of like a listicle rundown of the best of so i did just the best wish fulfillment movies recently there's a ton of them up there but if you find it it's episodes are only written by me or lawn so you know you're gonna have a good time with it um otherwise guys thank you so much for joining us this has been really fun and thank you mark so much for for coming on and being flexible with the, the scheduling and stuff oh you know this, this was a joy i can't wait to do it again yeah well we're gonna have you thank back you, mark. Man. yeah absolutely so, uh, yeah, I guess that's going to be a, it for us tonight. Um, join us again in, I think, two weeks, right? Where it will be between the holidays. Um, and join us tomorrow night at 7, a little bit different time uh, for Ace and Adam and me to be doing the Matrix uh, Revolution movie in honor of the new Matrix movie that's coming out because I know Kung Fu. Okay, guys, see you later. Bye. Bye.